Greetings, urban farmers, gardeners, and healthy food visionaries. Greg Peterson here, and welcome to the 317th episode of the Urban Farm Podcast, where every day we work together educating and inspiring you to become part of your food revolution. Nature doesn't waste energy, and by using these natural cycles to work in our favor, we can harvest both plants and fish. Let us teach you how. Just text GROWFISH to 33444 or visit IWANTTOGROWFISH.COM and you will receive our free webinar on how to grow your own fish-powered garden. Today on our podcast, we have someone who studied insect influence on soil. We're talking with Mary Tiedemann about soil formation. Mary is a soil scientist and agroecology PhD student at Florida International University in Miami. Originally from Iowa, she received her BS and MS degrees in environmental science and agronomy at Iowa State University. Her master's research was on ants and the ways they influence prairie soil. Her passion for soils has taken her across the globe, from Alaska to tropical rainforests and many places in between, all in hopes to better understand soil functioning in different ecosystems. When not chipping away at her dissertation, Mary is a volunteer blogger for Soils Matter, a blog run by the Soil Science Society of America, which is working to share soils information with broad audiences like y'all out there. Welcome to the show today, Mary. Are you ready to rock? You bet. Thanks for having me. You bet. So I shared a bit about you. Can you fill in the blanks for us and share more about the path you took to get where you're at today? Well, certainly. I would say that I didn't really know it was possible to be a soil scientist or even that that line of work existed until I was an undergraduate at Iowa State University. And when I was there, I was enrolled in their environmental science program and realized that there was an opportunity to study soils in Ghana, in Western Africa. Wow. Yeah. What was really amazing about that trip was, first of all, the professor that led the trip is a man by the name of Dr. Andrew Manu, a Ghanaian himself, and he took us all across the country and explore different ecosystems there, including tropical rainforests, all the way north into desert areas. And we got to see the natural soils, so soils that were still in the ecosystems from which those soils were built. So, Mm -hmm. for example, a tropical forest, and we're able to compare them to the same soils, but with different land management practices. Mm -hmm. And so we studied the different aspects in the field to measure soil quality. So infiltration rates and soil color and respiration rates and things like that. And I just fell in love with it. it. It's not only a surprisingly creative field. You get to do field work and lab work and everything in between. And it's just, it's been really rewarding. Nice. So I have to ask you, why does all that stuff matter? The land use portion? Yeah. How we're using the land, how the soil looks, all the stuff that you were studying there in Guyana. So what was really incredible is that just simply from transforming a soil system from tropical rainforest into a cultivated field. We studied fields that had been in grain as well as rubber plantations and everything in between. And what we saw was just such a dramatic reduction in soil quality. So the infiltration rates were reduced, which means that forest soils were far better at absorbing water quickly. So that's preventing erosion from occurring. It's also you know, making sure that soil moisture is available for the plant roots. Whereas in the cultivated areas, the quality, the infiltration rates were just not as good. Other examples were soil structure. So the structure of the topsoil in these tropical systems were just beautiful. We we call it granular structure where it almost looks like cookie crumbs Uh or cookie crumbles. But when you started to get into these more cultivated systems that had experienced a lot of erosion and had lower organic matter rates, the structure was also not as strong. And so there's just not as many pore spaces, it's more compacted, and that has plenty of implications for plant growth, just to name a few. So you mentioned organic matter. Organic matter, in my world, is one of the most important things that we have in our soil. You bet. I I call it the king. (laughs) The king. Oh, really? Tell us more about that. 
organic matter is not only a long-term nutrient source for plants and microorganisms in the soil, but it's also the glue that holds everything together. And so, again, when you're talking about aggregate structure, the signs of a really healthy soil are that cookie crumble structure. And the reason why that's so important to have is because it allows for gas exchange and for water to infiltrate and to be held adequately into the soil. And organic matter just pretty much does everything that you want it to do. The chemical makeup of the organic matter, you know, not only does it attract particles together, but it helps maintain other nutrients that might be produced, you know, through other avenues, whether it be through legumes or microbial activity. Mm -hmm. Organic matter just kind of sticks everything to it and in turn makes the soil a healthier system. Yeah. So a couple of things about that. I teach about soil in my in my podcast and in my classes and I say that there are five components of healthy soil and that is dirt, which we all have lots mm -hmm. of, air space, water, organic matter and everything that's alive in the soil. Right. So what I want to ask you is what makes in your world what makes soil soil? In classic soil scientist, if any of your listeners have ever taken a soils class, we talk about the five soil forming factors. We think of soil as, like you said, mineral material that has organic components, a biological, you know, active organism, or the capability of housing living organisms. Mm -hmm. Also airspace and water. So oxygen, carbon dioxide, and water. And these five soil forming factors, so we've got parent material, so the mineral material mm -hmm. that was the base of the soil, the climate factor, the organism factor, topography or the relief of a landscape, and time. All of these factors work together over time to create the specific characteristics that you might see in any given geographic location. Mm -hmm. So all of those five factors can explain why the soils in northern Alaska are going to be quite different from the soils in Puerto Rico. Say. Mm -hmm. Right. So I am reading on the Soils Matter blog, and you wrote an article back in April of this year, How Do I Keep My Raised Beds Soils Healthy? Let's talk about that. If somebody's putting a raised bed in their yard, how do they make sure that they soil, the soil is healthy in the raised bed? Well, I would say f first and foremost, to make sure that the bulk of the soil material that you find is from a trustworthy source. Mm -hmm. You know, you want to make sure that the soil is of a high enough quality to produce food on, because obviously you can, you can find soils from any given place that could be contaminated. Not, not to scare anyone, mm -hmm. but it's a very serious issue. You want to make sure that those soils aren't contaminated with lead or, or arsenic or anything like that. Before we go off that topic, how does one do that? How do we make sure that we're getting healthy soil? You can always get it tested by sending it off to your local extension agency, usually through land-grant institutions. Mm -hmm. There's a soil health lab that can analyze samples for you. But otherwise, I would say just if you have distributors in your area, some signs that you might make you more concerned would be if the soils came from an urban area mm -hmm. versus farther out of town where there might not have been issues with contamination. But I'd, I'd say that just doing a little bit of research and maybe communicating with the different companies that are selling soil just right. to have a dialogue, I think is at least important. You know, in, in local food systems, we talk about knowing your farmer. It sounds to me like in order to get good, healthy soil, we want to make sure that we know our soil guy or gal. Right, exactly. My soil person happens to be a gal, and she is passionate about it. Great. So step number one for raised beds, and really, we can probably say for garden beds in general, whether they're raised or not, right? Right. Yeah. So step number one is make sure that you have a good, solid source of healthy soil. Okay, number two? Organic matter. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, obviously, this too depends on your location. So I grew up in Iowa, and one thing that most people didn't have an issue with was the amount of organic carbon already in their soil. Mm -hmm. But if you're dealing with material that's, you know, super sandy or high in clay and just, you know, if the texture is difficult or if the soils you know aren't very fertile, one way to just boost the nutrient content 
of that soil is to add organic matter. Mm -hmm. And not only that, but it kind of boosts the microbial activity in the soils. Right. And those microbes also have their own very important role in making your soils more productive. When you say organic material, there's really a diversity of organic matter that you could add. Would I want to add something like wood chips into my garden? I would say to be a little cautious about the way that you add wood chips, mm -hmm. because the biggest concern from my end is that you might offset your carbon nitrogen balance. Right. Wood chips have a very high carbon content and a, a relatively low nitrogen content. Mm -hmm. If you add too much carbon to your soils without balancing the nitrogen right out the gate, what can happen is you'll have really slow decomposition rates of that mulch or wood chip. I would say mulch and wood chips have a very important role to play, but it's more to be added to the surface yeah. Of, of your soil beds, you know, to help retain moisture. Have you been listening to my lectures? No, no, uh, I haven't. Because <laughs> I say you put mulch and wood chips on and you put compost and potting mixes in your soils. Oh, awesome. Good. So I passed the test. It wasn't a test, but yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So lots of organic matter. Know where you're getting your soil. So what else is there that we can do to make sure that we're getting really healthy soil in our garden beds? So I would say some very important factors to consider is, first and foremost, make sure that you do your best to avoid compaction. Mm -hmm. You want to make sure that you set up your, your garden beds so that you can reach into the center of the bed to harvest mm -hmm. or whatever activities you want to do. You want to make sure that you can reach to the center without having to crawl into the bed. Yeah. Because any weight that you put down on that soil causes compaction, and it's essentially like squeezing a sponge where, you know, you have all these nice pore spaces and water holding capabilities in this sponge. And when you compress it, everything squeezes out. But the trouble, the difference between a sponge is the sponge will bounce back where a soil will be stuck like that until you really work hard to, you know, to get it back to where it was before. Right. So number one, try not to stand on it, kneel on it to avoid any compaction. Mm -hmm. When I tell people the, the perfect garden bed is four feet wide. Yeah, exactly. Don't go any wider, wider than four feet because then you have to step into it. Right. Unless you're Michael Phelps and you've got a wingspan <laughs> there that, you can, go. that can handle it. But for most people, four feet is perfect. And then promoting soil drainage? Yes. Supporting drainage is, is really important. You want to make sure that the roots in your system have not an adequate amount of oxygen. If you don't adequately maintain drainage, then your roots could get saturated and roots need oxygen just like humans do. Mm -hmm. And they can die quite quickly if their feet get wet or too wet. Mm -hmm. So compaction helps with drainage, but also, you know, you can make sure that the, the very base of your bed is maybe in rocks or gravel. Yeah. So very, very important. Perfect. And then adding organic matter every year. Every season when you're growing your favorite crops or vegetables, fruits, whatever, you know, whatever your interests are, those plants are, are taking up nutrients from the soil. Mm -hmm. And the way to replenish that is to add back organic matter. You can do it early in the spring. I mean, depending on your seasons, of course. Before the season starts, you could add organic matter. And even possibly at the, at the end of the season might mm -hmm. be a, a time to to add that material back into the soil, kind of Perfect. replenish what you've taken out. And then back to our mulch conversation of a little while ago, we want to cover our soil. Tell us about that. Yes. So one big concern, I hope every gardener and definitely every soil scientist, is erosion. Covering your soil helps prevent particles from moving around. It serves as kind of a blanket that not only protects from erosion, but it's also an insulator. And mm -hmm. so whether... You're worried about early season frosts or late season frosts or the opposite. If you're concerned about really hot environment, that mulch serves as a thermos, essentially, that can keep the soil cool mm -hmm. when it's really hot outside and it can keep it nice and warm if it's cold outside. To add to that, mulch also is just really helpful when, you know, when you're in an an arid climate or an area where soil moisture can be mm -hmm. lost very yeah. readily. Mulch can be problematic if you've had too much moisture, though. For example, I worked at a farm in, in Iowa several years back 
we had the rainiest season that we had experienced in a long, long time. Uh Uh-huh we had mulched onions and onions are particularly sensitive to too much moisture. All right. We ended up having to pull all of the mulch out because that soil was so wet that, and the mulch was just kind of exacerbating the mm-hmm. the issue because none of the water was evaporating. So sometimes under certain cir- circumstances, mulch might be more of a challenge to you, but especially in the off season, if you don't have a cover crop on your bed, right? the best alternative to that would be mulch just to protect the soil in the interim. Well, and you could even put in green mulch, grow your, you know, an off season crop of something and till it in, right? Yeah. And, you know, just serves as green manure, de- yeah. most definitely. So young soils versus old soils. What's the difference? How do they change over time? What can we do to nurture our young soils into older soil? Yeah, it's funny to think of soils having a birth date, just like you and me. I would say that from a soil scientist perspective, we think of soil transitioning from a young to an old over time, revolving around development. Mm -hmm. From the very early ages of a soil, there's not going to be very much development. Day one of a soil is going to be either just rock that's been exposed to the elements, or alternatively, it could be a glacial till from a glacier that's receded or mud flats from a riverbank. Mm-hmm. And so there's really nothing there. You know, there's potential, right, to facilitate plant growth, but not much activity. And so the first thing to happen is that plants will begin to establish themselves in organisms into that material, that parent material. Right. Over time, with the forcings of climate and organisms and the shape of the landscape or gravitational forces, the soil will start to become more developed. And that means that it will begin to develop layers Mm -hmm. or what we call soil horizons. Each horizon has its own particular characteristics. So the surface horizon, an A horizon, is the first one really to become developed. And that's where the most biological activity occurs. So you start to get a buildup of organic matter over time, and all of the organisms in that soil allow for structure to start to develop. Then as the soil gets older and older, it becomes more and more sorted. What that means is that finer particles will begin to move downward into what we refer to as the B horizon. If you're digging deep into a soil, you're likely to see an A horizon and a B horizon. And that B horizon has a higher amount of clay and it might have an accumulation of carbonates or materials that dissolved from the surface horizon and then kind of re-precipitated or re-accumulated down into the B horizon. Looking more like dirt then, right? Well, n- not necessarily. I guess or the farther and deeper down you dig, the more similar the soil is going to be to its original parent material. Right. That makes sense. Yeah. So a B horizon is still going to look a lot different than the original parent material because it's actually gaining a lot. You know, it's got more concentrated materials in that horizon than in potentially the the sea horizon below it. We would refer to the sea horizon, which is below the B horizon, to Mm -hmm. be the horizon that has the most similar characteristics to the parent material. Got it. And what we're really after as gardeners and farmers is the A horizon stuff with lots of organic matter and so on, right? Sure, yeah. I noticed in your bio, and I want to make sure that we get to this before, you know, before we transition, you worked a lot with ants. And I get a lot of input on a yearly basis from people saying, oh my gosh, I got these ants in my backyard. How do I kill them? And I'm a big proponent of as long as they're you know, pretty much leaving you alone, Mm -hmm. you know, leave them alone because they're valuable citizens of our soil biology. Is that the case? Well, I have to say that the ants that I worked with in my, in my master's research actually had a tremendous role in promoting soil quality Mm -hmm. in these particular soils. And like you said, it depends on the circumstance. If you've got fire ants, I don't know how to deal with those. I'm from Iowa, and luckily we haven't <laughs> we haven't had those. But depending on the type of ants that you've got, the situation might be different. The ants that I worked with had a tremendous 
role in in building soil health. And the, simply put, the explanation of how they did it is just that they mix the soil up. Mm, right. So going back to soil development over time, one general trend as a soil gets older, you know, and I'm talking on the years uh, or on the a very different time frame. My perspective on soil development is is the soil 30,000 years old right? or is the soil 20 million years old? Geologic time. Exactly. But from that standpoint, as a soil ages, you know, and material begins to move downward deeper into the soil, some of those materials that are moving downward are beneficial for soil fertility. And so what we found in this prairie system that I studied was that all of these bases that were maintaining a neutral soil pH, mm-hmm. theoretically, they should have been moving downward over time in the soil profile. But the activity of these ants was to mix that soil matrix back up. And by doing that, they were preventing the acidification of the surface horizon. Wow. Improving or maintaining a high quality of soil for this prairie system to yeah. be maintained. When they're aerating the soil as well, are they not? Yeah, most definitely. Yep, so they're doing all sorts of of different ecosystem services, maintaining pH, maintaining the aggregate stability and the structure of the soil, decomposition of organic matter. In simply mixing the soil, they were doing so many specific and very important things for soil quality. Perfect. So don't be mean to your ants. They're helping us out in our gardens. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to shift on you, and I'd like for you to talk about a time you failed, how you overcame that failure, and what you learned from it. I look back to the first time I ever had to give a lecture. Uh huh. <laughs> when I was a master's student, my major professor, Dr. Lee Burris, was not able to lecture one of his courses, and he asked me if I would do it, but of course with the stipulation that I create my own content. Oh my gosh. But luckily, you know, I got to choose my favorite topic, which was glaciers at the time, Mm -hmm. like any any normal soil scientist. So anyways, I created this lecture, and it was for a class. It was a 50-minute lecture for a class of 130 students. I just, I thought I was going to die. I was, I was terrified through the whole process. I went to the lecture, and I brought a map, a physical map with me. Uh-huh. And of course, nobody in the lecture hall could see, could see what it. I was pointing at. Oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> I've been there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, it's your first time doing it, so how are you? really going to know all of the, you know, all of the things that you're supposed to think about. Right. I tremored through the whole class and I just, I came out of it feeling humiliated, like a dog with my tail between my legs. I just figured I never, ever wanted to do that again. But I I managed to suck up enough pride to go to the next lecture. Mm -hmm. My boss had everybody write down two things on a piece of paper. The first being what was something that Mary could improve upon. Uh Uh-huh. And what is something that you really enjoyed about the lecture? Wow. Bonus to him. (laughs) I know. So I collect 130 pieces of feedback on a day when I was feeling particularly brave. Mm -hmm. I pulled them out of my desk and I, I read through them. And I realized that the number one criticism that students had or suggestion that students had was just for me to chill out. <laughs> you know, it, it was just a really enlightening experience yeah. to, to read these these pieces of paper that said, we trust you, so you should trust yourself. Mm-hmm. I figure if I taken that experience the wrong way, then I probably never would have taught a class again. But by right. the end of my master's degree, I had lectured over 30 classes and was a co-instructor for two different courses and taught my own lab. Yeah. So looking back, I've, I've grown a lot since that first 50-minute lecture. Yeah, and you know, there's a really important lesson here for everybody listening out there, and that's that for your area of expertise, you know what you're talking about. And as long as you know, and I tell this to people, as long as you know 5 or 10 or 15% more than the people you're lecturing to, you're golden. <laughs> You just need to remember that, right? Right. It is funny, you know, the circumstances. But no, it's it's totally true. Yeah, and we're doing it to ourselves. I spoke this morning in front of a legal panel, and I was nervous. And I just had to take a deep breath and remember that I knew what I was talking about. And that's where I came from. So for those of you listening out there, take this lesson to heart. You know what you're talking about and share it. 
Sure. And in all ways, you're going to be your harshest critic. Yeah, exactly. So what do you consider your biggest success? Well, I would say upon reflection related back to my my failure is I feel so honored to be able to represent the Soil Science Society of America on a platform oh, like yeah. this. Uh, this this is the, the third radio or podcast opportunity that I've had to communicate science that I'm, I'm quite passionate about to broader audiences. And I'm just so grateful that the people at the Soil Science Society of America <laughs> are willing to let me be that person. There you are, being your harshest critic again, right? Most definitely. But you only get better over time yep. and experience. Exactly. And if you were too afraid of failure, you'd never, you'd right. never get better. You only get better over time, as does soil if you're adding organic matter most definitely cool how i folded that in there huh <laughs> so what drives you well knowledge i've been a self-proclaimed nerd ever since i can remember mm -hmm. and i just think that the outside world is absolutely fascinating i'm very grateful to be able to pursue my interests and be paid for it i'm very grateful mm -hmm. for that you know to just learn every day but on top of that i just love soil i love talking about soil so if anyone is willing to listen to me, I am <laughs> I'm most grateful to them. So not only learning, but also just being able to share my joy with other people, whether they are willing to hear it or not. Beautiful. So if you could recommend one book for our listeners, what would it be and why? I'm so excited to be able to share this book. It's by the first African woman and first environmentalist to win a Nobel Peace Prize. Oh, wow. Yeah, her name is Wangari Masai, and the book is a memoir called Unbowed. Well, first and foremost, Wangari Masai has led an absolutely tremendous life. She passed away in 2011, I believe, but she came from very humble means in rural Kenya, and just due to luck and circumstance, she was able to find funding to go past a primary education and found her way, you know, into a doctoral program. She was the founder of the Green Belt Movement in Kenya. Wow. Yeah, which connected rural women to train them to grow seedlings and distribute those seedlings to reforestation projects throughout Kenya. How cool is that? Yeah. And, you know, one important thing about it is it seems like a very straightforward movement, but she dealt with tremendous personal, political, and legal fallout because of it. On a number of occasions, she was imprisoned in Kenya, and she had to flee outside of Kenya for several years to protect herself from threats to her life. Wow. Yeah, but I think most important relating it to soil is she has a tremendous understanding and she outlines so eloquently the connection between natural ecosystems and soil quality. Mm -hmm. And it's just a delightful read. Very empowering. Nice. Thank you for that. I, I think I'm sitting here thinking, I think I have that on my shelf to read. Oh, it's, it's fantastic. <laughs> So what one final piece of advice do you have for our listeners? I would say that if you've got an idea and you're nervous to implement it, maybe read up on it as much as you can. But at some point, you just have to get out there and do it. If you aren't successful the first time around, you'll definitely learn some lessons from it. The more practice you get, the better you'll become, the more able you'll be able to handle setback. Whether you're a graduate student and you're contemplating different ideas for your research, or you are a farmer or a gardener, no matter what it is, just get out there and try it. Yeah. You'll learn from it. Perfect. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us on the show today, Mary. Yes. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. So how can our listeners get a hold of you? It would be wonderful if you checked out our blog. It's at soilsmatter.wordpress.com. Perfect. You could also just Google Soils Matter. Mm -hmm. That's what I did, actually. <laughs> oh, perfect. And also, our other website is soils.org. Oh, nice. Perfect. That is the website for the professional society. Mm -hmm. But we have a whole section dedicated to public readership called Discover Soils. And that's on the top left portion of the, the main tab on mm -hmm. the front page. Perfect, perfect. You can find show notes from today's podcast at urbanfarm.org forward slash soil matters. We are your urban farming resource. You can find our podcasts on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and iHeartRadio. Also visit urbanfarm.org 
to find articles, podcasts, webinars, courses, and more. Well, that's it for today. Thanks for joining us on the Urban Farm Podcast. Nature doesn't waste energy, and by using these natural cycles to work in our favor, we can harvest both plants and fish. Let us teach you how. Just text GROWFISH to 33444 or visit IWantToGrowFish.com and you will receive our free webinar on how to grow your own fish-powered garden. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Urban Farm Podcast. Remember to listen for tips, advice, and resources to help you on your journey with urban farming. You can find us on the web at urbanfarm.org or send us an email to podcast at urbanfarm.org. In the words of Vincent Van Gogh, great things are done by a series of small things brought together. Be encouraged that with each lesson learned and skill developed, you are one step closer in the direction of your dreams.